Thank you so much for it. And thank you so much for the introduction. Really excited that everybody's here uh, to kind of learn from our journey and kind of learn from our, our mistakes and our expertise uh, at the same time. So a little bit about who's going to be talking today. So I have my buddy Surya and Thor with me, but Surya, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself and Thor after that, maybe a little bit of background about yourself, what you do here at Harness. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, so I have been at Harness for the last um, 18 months, 20 months or so. I joined as kind of building out the SRE team at Harness. And uh, before that, I was in the same role uh, at Symantec. So I started off my career as a software engineer and then slowly moved on to this full OpenStack cloud, then AWS and now GCP at Harness. And uh, with SRE, right, there is a, everything, every day is something new to learn. And even on this call, uh, during the Q&A, please feel free to ask the questions, right? It's like, it's, it's always good to know, it's always good to learn. And that's what keeps this whole SRE thing interesting for me. Yeah. Hey. To talk. yeah. 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 So, uh, yes, please ask Suri the questions. Uh, he's the uh, experienced one in the room <laughs> with regards to that. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Thor Taylor. I've uh, work product here at Harness. Um, so I've been here for about nine months uh, and I have been spending my time here working on a product called change intelligence. Um Obviously, at Harness, we've been heavily focused on the DevOps engineer, really the dev lifecycle when we think about CICD. Uh, and my effort, I've been working in, I'll say, the data realm when we talk about logs, metrics, and traces, and these types of things for about 15 years. Um, and so I'm bringing a lot of that uh, information here as we start looking at um, SREs and understanding the separation that currently exists between DevOps engineers and SREs and trying to figure out how can we build a product that helps to kind of bring those worlds together? Awesome introduction, fellas. And I'm Robbie Lockman. I'm a, the evangelist here at Harness. I'm really focused on the ecosystem. Also, I've been creating outages for Surya to deal with. But now, you know, with all the guardrails we have in place and all the learnings we have, my outages are now blameless. <laughs> I can't <laughs> pin it to me yet. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And so what are we going to be talking about today? So the first thing is, just introduction to like reliability in general, right? So reliability has different meanings for different people, but really what is the introduction of this SRE role and how do, how do you actually further that engineering innovation? And then we're gonna be talking about, well, you know, a couple of years ago when we really started focusing on reliability engineering, it was really a journey. Uh, funny story, uh, Surya's first week here, we had one of our biggest outages and he's still here. So thank you, Surya, for sticking around. Uh, but really like we had to go on a journey to make uh, our platform more reliable for our customers because our customers depend on us, similar to how the world works. Then also uh, things that we've run into, right? So even as we're scaling our reliability engineering and reliability practices and the robustness of our platform, uh, still there's always room for improvement, right? So things that we notice in the marketplace, things that we notice internally, things that we notice externally, and we'll kind of put that all in a nice little pretty package for you in the next 30 or 40 minutes. And again, love to keep it interactive, keep those questions uh, towards the end. We'll address uh, every single one of them as they come uh, towards the end. And so reliability, what does this actually mean, right? So my car is reliable, it starts every time, but you know, in software land, actually, or even uh, you know, in, in physical land, like what is reliability? So there are three main pillars of reliability. Uh, you, you would, as an end user, you would view something as reliable that mainly is a trustworthy, right? Like, hey, I trust going to, it's very funny. Like if I ever think like my at t fiber is down, I immediately go to cnn.com because CNN is never down, right? If I can get to that, that means there's something wrong with at t uh, But they're a trustworthy source, right? And also because they're trustworthy and maybe authoritative, that they're highly performant, right? Like when have you ever gone to one of your favorite websites and you know they're not there? You know, you went to Twitter. When's the last time you saw the fail wheel? or AWS or Amazon, when you when was the last time you saw the dog looking at you all sad? Or CNN, when was the last time it doesn't come up, right? And so having these things be performant really makes it to appear either it's actually reliable or the appearance of reliability. And that's what, what a lot of site reliability engineering does. It's giving you the appearance of reliability or mitigating the manifestation of an outage. And again, given, you know, if something's trustworthy and performant, clearly it's gonna be available to you, right? And so with these three factors, you might say, you know what, the, the system or this object uh, is reliable. But there's another problem here, right? So given if we only had one server and one static IP and you know one instance of Apache serving up something, 
um, that's pretty easy, right? Like, hey, you know what? If it goes down, we can boot it right back up. If someone unplugs the power cord, plug the power cord back in. Uh, as, as much as a joke as that is, uh, our systems are quite complex these days, right? There's dozens of the hundreds of transitive dependencies or highly coupled or decoupled it, uh, dependencies. And, you know, if you if leveraging a modern microservice framework, you might have one call to the user, but it aggregates out to like a dozen backend services to aggregate and consolidate a response to the user. And distributed systems are complex, right? Like, hey, you know what? We, we might be designing for the happy path, you know, like, hey, between service A and B, but it needs to call C, D, E, and F and Z, you know, how do we measure A to Z, right? With the intermediate boundary of B. And this it gets very, very complex, right? Like, hey, building a complex system, you know, you just kind of plug the thing and plug it back in, you know, there's hundreds of services and distributed infrastructure, you might be using containerization technology, the public cloud, Kubernetes, all the buzzwords is your, uh, you have different infrastructure, different application requirements, uh, and just different expectations, right? So my background, uh, I used to work for an investment bank as an application owner. You know, I only had, I owned like five endpoints, right? But, you know, what was my contract uh, for a response? And we'll get into this in, in a couple of minutes, right? Like, hey, how do we know something's performant? How do we know, you know, what is my, my agreement with the business or agreement with the end user? And each one of these could be different. And this is part of what's, you know, when you're navigating site reliability engineering, is what you have to negotiate. And so uh, basically th this is the, the adage, right? And so it, slowness is a new down. You might've heard this from a few pundits that it, it's one thing that it's very rare that a service is completely down. Like there's just, it's a black hole. You can't get to it, but it's more common in, in systems and technologies and distributed systems that you're getting a very slow response. There could be a de 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 uh, degradation of response. There might be, you know, with a manifestation of a problem that might be degrading, like, hey, there's network constriction or there's a, da a database constriction somewhere, uh, is that slows and you down, right? So, so to your end users, you know, if, you, if they're waiting 20, 30 seconds for a response, you might as well just be off, you know, you get attribution and um, ba ba basically like, hey, adoption will drop after a certain point, right? Or, you know, your shopping cart abandonment, you know, the old, good old e-commerce example, people would abandon, abandon their carts and they didn't get a response. Same thing, if I don't, you know, get a response from at t right away, I'm hitting up my favorite site to see if, you know, my fiber modem goes down. It goes down more than I like it to be. Uh, also, kind of this, this old adage, uh, my manager used to tell me this, and they still do to this day, but you can't improve what you can't measure, right? And so, so there's, there's many ways, there's, very, there's subjective and objective ways of measuring system performance and system behavior, right? So objective might be, can we get a response in 1800 milliseconds? Subjective, is it slow? Okay, you know, what's slow for Surya might be fast for Thor or vice versa. What's, you know, slow for Thor might be fast for me. Beauty could be in the eye of the beholder, but you need to have some sort of way to, to kind of like baseline yourself and to measure, you know, hey, what is reliability? Is it, you know, can we measure those three things? Can we measure availability? Sure we can. Can we, can we measure uh, confidence? Yeah, maybe, you know, depending on user satisfaction. But again, finding the right measures to measure something is also a challenge. And th this old argument, like cats versus dogs, oh, two evolving disciplines are your DevOps at, uh, discipline and also SRE discipline. Um, there actually, there, there's lots of similarities and also there's differences between uh, a, a DevOps culture and an SRE culture or practice. There's certainly overlap. Um, I caught a lot of flack on Twitter, probably not Twitter, but Reddit. The Reddit gods were not smiling with me. I made a table kind of comparing like how a DevOps engineer would handle an outage versus how an SRE would handle an outage or like, hey, application clustering, like, you know, one has to know the consensus algorithm, one has to know the number of nodes, you know, and it's, it, it's it, they are similar jobs, right? But, you know, focusing on efficiency and, and kind of what the, the connective tissue between these two groups as we're going along, right? Maybe you're working at a small place, maybe you're like, you know what, I do the development pipeline and reliability uh, because there's only one of me or two of me uh, on a team. Uh, the connective tissue, tissue is uh, information dissemination, right? So these are both expertise roles. How do you disseminate or how do you eliminate technical debt, right? So as a software engineer, a, a lot of uh, Surya's job actually is making sure that, it's jokes aside, like I create outages here, how do I distill information to Robbie that he doesn't have to worry about technical debt to how to scale a system? Let, let him write the feature, scaling will be taken care of by somebody else. And that's just what uh, Surya's gonna talk, be talking about in a little bit. And then let's talk about some key, key measurements though, you know, like, hey, as we go along this journey, you might hear a, a, a trio of S words here. So an SLA, an SLO, and an SLI. 
but just for level setting what these things are as we go forward. So the first thing is, is SLA. I used to think that everything was a service level agreement, uptime SLA, response time SLA. Um, but no, there actually, there's nuances as you dig into, if you read the book, you know, the, the Google SRE handbook or any sort of you know, literature that extends out, or even talk to thought leaders like Thor and Surya, uh, you know, they'll give you like a more concise answer, right? So a service level agreement is basically that commitment to a customer, right? That could be an internal customer or external customer. And basically is that <clears throat> it's it crafted around um, customer expectation, right? And so, uh, and, and a very easy example here, I, let's say I was selling Robbie's lemonade as a service or last or last <laughs> as a service. I would say, you know what? As a customer, it will give you 99% uptime, right? Like if you pay me $10 a month for lemonade, uh, I will be there 99% of the time. And so this is what a service level agreement is. It's a commitment to, to a customer, internal or external. Now, Digging into that SLA is like, or SLOs, service level objectives, right? So what an SLO is, is basically how are you going to meet those SLAs? So how am I going to achieve my 99% uptime? Well, one particular measure might be response time, right? Or, or reply time that, you know, there's other ways to measure it, right? But if we're just taking one easy to measure aspect of it might be, you know what? I need to reply in 2000 milliseconds, 99.5% of the time over a set duration. So let's say over 30 days, right? So if, if uh, one of you were my <laughs> um, lemonade as a service customer, I'll be saying yes or no if you have lemonade uh, within two seconds, uh, you know, 99.5% of the time over 30 days. And really these particular SLOs is basically that. So uh, they're time boxed with duration. And also again, it's showing how you're gonna meet the commitment. You know, one SLA might have multiple SLOs. But there's one more, more granular level of measurement, which is an SLI, a service level indicator. So basically a definition of a service level indicator is that it's a compliance to an SLO, right? So given that, if you remember back in the previous slide, you know, 90 or 99.5% uh, has to be answered in 2000 milliseconds or less. Um, basically an SLO is, or pardon me, SLI is measuring that compliance. So you can see here, uh, you know, our, our first request uh, it was 1900 milliseconds. So that was a good and valid request. Uh, our second request, let's say someone else asked, you know, for some odd reason, I had to think a little bit more. Um, that was 2500 milliseconds, right? And that is bad and, and invalid. And so really making sure that we're calculating that correctly, you know, because of those two requests over two, um, you know, we would actually be in a, in a poor state uh, based on, uh, you know, this indicator uh, for SLO. And again, there's only two requests, you know, clearly it could be thousands and thousands and thousands of requests. Um, it normally in a, in a normal system over a very short period of time, but this is basically a leading indicator of how your SLO is going to be either going to be bursting your SLO or you're adhering uh, to your SLO. And so another uh, particular way, another popular way of measuring, right? So response time is one of them. There's this thing called the four golden signals. So it was uh, again coming out of the Google S rebook. Uh, there are things you can measure for, right? You can measure for latency, uh, you can measure for traffic, you can measure for errors and saturation. So uh, basically uh, looking at, hey, de defining these latency might be, hey, what's the delay in a response, right? You know, what what is that latency? Uh, saturation could be a, a factor of load, right? And so like, hey, you know what? Uh, our, our system, you know, we're handling all the requests, but we're fully saturated. You know, we're, we're pegged at 100% memory, 100% CPU. Uh, you know, this, if we're oversaturated, we're pushing the bounds of the system. And clearly like you can measure amount of requests for traffic and also errors, right? As they start to increase or decrease, uh, these are things to measure, but don't just take my word for it. Let me introduce my buddies, uh, Surya here. Uh, to kind of talk about, well, what is SRE at uh, practice and finally at scale look like at Harness of Surya? Take it away, my friend. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Roy. Thank you. So whatever we are going to cover in the next few slides, right? Uh, it's all are the practices that are already covered in the Google book, right? The Google SRE book. So, uh, and this is how we do at Harness based on the principles that they define in the book. And there is nothing right or wrong in the way you do things. It depends from team to team, from your infrastructure to infrastructure. And these are some of the practices that we do at Harness. Again, uh, please feel free to ask Q&A after the webinar is done, right? So as an SRE, I mean, what is one's job? Pretty much, right? You want to make sure that your system is performing uh, at its scale for your end customers, right? And for that to know, how will you know how your system is performing? You need to know, 
have an insight into all these observability and the visibility metrics that Ravi pretty much touched upon initially. So, right, so uh, the golden, uh, the go good metrics that Ravi covered, they are all good, right? But what is important from a service point of view are the service level metrics. And for the service level metrics are what defines how your application is performed. So at Harness, uh, we have our engineers closely working with our SREs, right? The engineers write the code, they know exactly what the service is supposed to do, what are the metrics that we need to measure to say that the service is performing good or bad. So we work with engineering to define these application metrics. And all of our infrastructure is in GCP. Uh, we run on GKE and uh, we use Stackdriver uh, or cloud logging uh, for our application metrics. So the first bullet point in summary is work with your engineering team and make sure for each of the services that is powering your application, you have the proper application level metrics. The golden signals are well and good, right? And we do use them for measuring the overall how the application is performing, as well as overall how the services are performing, right? This is in addition to the application metrics, right? These are more on the infrastructure side. Now, so one of the thing, right? You do your deployment and you hope like everything is good, right? And if something is bad, <laughs> you don't want to hear it from the customer. You should be the one uh, who is catching what is wrong as soon as you do the deployment. So these golden signals definitely give an indication, right? For us, it, there has been a couple of times where we deployed into our production. We had a feature flag turned on and we see a huge spike in the overall application performance. I mean, that didn't cause us to roll back, but that did give us an indication like, okay, this is what is happening. The latency is too much. So maybe the feature flag is the culprit. We turned it off and things went back to normal. So, Focus on this as well as the configuration changes after every deployment, right? So you deploy, uh, we do deployments almost every day and uh, we are moving to the model where the engineers will do the deployment going forward for their services. Now the config changes, it could be as simple as you change your YAML spec to say, okay, the pod used to scale based on the CPU of 85%. Now I change it to 70% and that may have an impact, impact in production. Right, so always make sure like you have a way to track what configuration changes are happening between deployment A and deployment B. So that is one of the ways we make sure like after deployment things are going fine. Uh, the next bullet point is, I think everyone on the call knows about this alert fatigue, right? We define alerts left and right. We go for each service, we define so many alerts that what happens in the end is you have an overabundance of the alerts. Now you get it in your email, you get it on Slack, you tend to ignore them after a certain point of time. But what usually happens is you miss the actionable alerts, which ends up causing an incident in production. So you don't want that to happen. So there is nothing that is stopping an SRE from defining additional alerts. So we do that as well. But we make sure that those additional alerts are sent to a Slack channel, which only SREs monitor, right? But the actionable alerts are something like, we know that something is wrong with the system or something is going to wrong with the system. So we make sure that we define actionable alerts, which are pretty much visible to the entire engineering. So we have it to a different Slack channel. So one of the advantages of these actionable alerts is it will take care of this whole operational underload or knowledge gaps. This is pretty, again, whatever I'm mentioning, it's covered in the book, please go and refer it. So this underload or knowledge gap happens when your system is performing very well, right? Say you are at four nights, you are at five nights. So what is an SRE job? You do the deployment and you call it a day, right? So when you do that, you tend to forget about the system as a whole, right? You tend to build some knowledge gaps because of that. With actionable alerts, even though it may not lead to an incident, but where it helps is, it will tell you that, okay, you have introduced a new query in the database. For example, we use Mongo for our database, right? And engineers introduce new queries, new indexes, left and right. We want to be agile. But at the same time, this model causes some of these query performance issues in production. Now, 
will that have an immediate impact or uptime not really but is it good to chase after these actionable alerts absolutely yes so you make sure that the system will behave when uh, and will behave well uh, if you keep doing this as well as there won't be any knowledge gap uh, when you follow this model and the last one is uh, we did this only last quarter we started this exercise of this whole chaos testing where we introduced failures into the system and we see like okay if service a is dependent on service b we take the service b down and what happens to service a so that is at a very high level uh, that is what this chaos testing is i mean it can take its own webinar there are whole bunch of tools netflix covered it pretty well uh, what this chaos testing and if you use service mesh you know what this is all about but plan for chaos testing even if you have like few services plan for it and uh, make sure like you know what happens when a service goes down or when a service is overloaded so so that covers this slide so ravi can we go to the next one okay so so the harness is sari journey right like ravi mentioned i joined in feb 2020 and we had a first week itself we had a very bad incident and uh, at that time the engineering themselves uh, were taking the responsibility of running these services in production and they will take responsibilities as well going forward but i came in as the sre and uh, we build the team right but some of the things that again uh, whatever i'm describing it's our way of doing things it may be different for different teams so one of the things we did for our infrastructure is basically we run on gcp right we run we run on gke the managed kubernetes so we also used uh, managed services for our database like we use atlas mongo so one of the simplest thing we did uh, to begin with right we made sure that we have this vpc peering uh, set up between our gcp project with the atlas mongo to make sure that the traffic doesn't go over cloud net and the cloud net becomes a bottleneck so that's just one example of the improvement on the infrastructure we did we also made sure uh, like we have two regions so we are in us west one primarily serving our customers we have us west two we run in the active passive mode and uh, we make sure like we exercise that okay when we move to traffic over to us west two how does it perform so we do this activity once or twice every quarter so similarly for our mongo as well for our database as well uh, we have us west one and us west two where the us west two acts as more of a dr kind of a setup right so again infrastructure is different if you are hosting your own uh, in house infrastructure like we did back at semantic you have your own set of challenges managing that infrastructure so make sure like there are continuous improvements it's not like you do it one time and you are done it's like continuously we we make sure that wherever we find scope we do that right and again so when we build the team uh, we are right now four sre engineers two in us two in india and two dvs right the sre mindset is very important so when i say what sre mindset is like you always look for ways to automate things you are okay with chaos or we are okay with things not being stable you actually like to be in the thick of things it's okay to have an incident but you need to learn from it it's okay to have an alert so that sre mindset is very critical uh, one of the things that we do is like any incident that happens or anything that we want to communicate to our customers we provide them as rcs and uh, these rcs are blameless right it's not like okay this guy did something it happened because of that person and we had an incident it's more about why it happened what are the learnings that we took from it what are we going to do so that it doesn't happen again so we publish them all the time and this whole sre practice is right so it's not like old style model where the developers write the code they build the artifacts they throw it to the sres and say okay you deploy the code in production it's your headache that's not how uh, at least we don't operate like that so we make sure that a service service a uh, that gets written or that gets developed by the engineering they we are plugged in they know the sre practices right they know that they need to get on the pager duty call when something happens during production right they are all on the call it's not just the sres who are handling the incident in production but it's everyone on the engineering who is on the call based on which module or which service is possible so that's about the sre journey so far at harness so ravi next slide please 
So the last slide that uh, I would like to cover is like, uh, we try to be as transparent as we can with our customers, right? And uh, we publish our availability numbers on status site. I mean, no surprises there, status.harness.io. And uh, if you go there, you will see like Harness has a whole bunch of modules. We have CD, we have CI, we have feature flag, right? So all of those availability numbers we publish on a weekly basis, right? And in the last two quarters, uh, Feb to May, right? It, our availability has been 99.96. So that means we were kind of down for our customers for about 50 minutes in that quarter, in that 90 day time frame. In Q2, we did much better because we put a lot of guard, guardrails in place. So we were at our 4.9 target that we wanted to. And how we calculate these uh, uptime metrics, we use a combination of service level indicators per service. We use the real user metrics uh, that we get from App Dynamics, right? And we use a weightage based calculation in a combination for computing uptime. For example, a login has a very higher weightage when it comes to uptime because without logging in, you won't be able to do anything. But a dashboard which renders how your deployments are doing, what did you deploy last week or so, it is useful, but it won't stop the customer's um, pipelines to be executed or their deployments or anything of, of that sort. So for those, we have a lesser number of weightage. So again, it's, it's totally up to you, right? Whatever is always think from your customer point of view, what is the indicator that they are looking for to make sure that they are not disrupted? That will be your service level indicator and that will be your uptime. And like I covered briefly, right? We publish everything. It's very transparent. You can go to this Medium blog where you will see about our RCAs, about our incidents, as well as uh, the engineers pretty much keep blogging about what are the latest things that they did over the last quarter or what are the cool things that we are going to do? What is our deployment strategy? We even have our architecture diagram over there. So please feel free to go there and check it out. So uh, that's about it from my end. Uh, it's all yours next. Thank you, Surya. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I do want to just kind of quickly level set with everybody. There's been a lot of information, obviously, that's uh, being thrown at you guys, but we've tried to kind of break this up into three sections. The first section, which Ravi was talking to you about, was really about um, laying the foundation of SREs. What is an SRE? What can you expect um, from that role? So if you did miss it, you joined a little bit late, that's fine. Just, just rewatch it. And then what Suri just obviously went through was the state of affairs of SREs today from his experience here at Harness and essentially how we're trying to approach it. And then what I want to jump into, obviously, as a product manager, is I, I like to look at uh, the forward thinking world, right? So where, where is this actually going as we look across the spectrum of both DevOps and SREs? And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to just kind of talk about kind of where is the world at now, because we do see a paradigm shifting uh, taking place. Um, and so, you know, why is that paradigm shift happening? So obviously you guys know this, right? You have a lot of experience. You've been out there. You've been working in different capacities. And you recognize that, you know, whenever changes take place, um, it can potentially create problems. It can destabilize things and, and uh, people start yelling and looking for somebody to blame. Um, so I spent a lot, of, a lot of time in my early years supporting a lot of the large Fortune 500 companies in some of the more, uh, let's say, extreme conditions dealing with firewalls, uh, network routing issues, uh, switches, that sort of stuff. So I really worked on a lot of, let's say, the foundational components necessary to run a business. And uh, when I would work with these businesses, the first thing that I would ask always immediately when they come up with something urgent and saying, hey, we're losing a million dollars a minute, we need to fix this now. Uh, I'd always start with, okay, well, did something change recently? And if something did change recently, what was that change? And see if it relates to the problem that we're trying to investigate. Um, the issue, obviously, is that um, the ability to track changes wasn't so uh, so available for the individuals who are actually troubleshooting. So most of the time, the individuals I was working with couldn't answer the question of whether something had changed recently. Um, and so that essentially leads us to where the world had moved to, uh, you know, many years ago up and I would say even now it still operates this way, which is the idea that changes are scary. 
And because they're scary, we need to slow down. We need to do less of them. And so it created this, uh, this culture of essentially changing less often, but doing big, massive changes. So you might do it quarterly, you might do it semi-annually, but you, you want to be careful about how often you change. And so it introduced a number of different processes and systems, such as CMDB type systems, approval processes, created this whole culture of let's be careful when we change. So go to the next slide. Yeah. So, so we've got two groups that are actually now leading the charge of this paradigm shift, right? It's this recognition now that change actually isn't bad. Um, sure, it can be a little bit scary, but if we do it properly, we can actually change much faster. The introduction of services and microservices and, and uh, breaking apart applications into, uh, you know, like I said, the microservices has introduced this ability to do small changes incrementally rather than these big, massive changes. The challenge that we have is the two groups that are leading the charge, DevOps and SREs, um, have really different goals in mind. Uh, if we take a look at the DevOps engineers, they're very focused on velocity. They want to get changes out the door quickly. They've implemented um, uh, systems uh, such as uh, the door metric, so being able to monitor very specific things to make sure changes they're introducing aren't causing problems, but they're very interested in getting features out the door, which obviously makes customers happy because they want features uh, quickly delivered to them. The SREs, on the other hand, have to look at the broader picture, right? So they're not looking at just the application of the services being delivered. They're looking at all the underpinning architecture, the platform and the services and systems, the hardware, all of this stuff that is that goes into making this successful. And so what they do, and this is what Ravi had talked about with regards to SLOs, and, and I'm going to kind of break that up a little bit here. Um, SLOs are typically designed around the user journey, right? So unlike the door metrics, which are looking at traditional metrics and things like that, SLOs are focused on, uh, on the user journey. You wanna identify what are the happy path? What are the things that my application or system needs to deliver for a customer? And then we want to measure that. And that helps us to identify whether those customers are able to be successful or not accessible, uh, successful, irrespective of let's say the service fail, and it could be a component like a database that the service relies upon that's having issues. But if you're tracking the entire journey, you'll actually be able to know whether things uh, that customer is happy or not. So you kind of have these two spectrums. One is focused on um, change velocity, getting features out. Uh, the other one is heavily focused on reliability and making sure that those changes don't destabilize and that customer is able to, um, to be happy in the process. Okay. So um, what we look at is we've been talking to customers and analysts again here at Harness is we're trying to figure out customers with their change velocity, meaning that they can either increase it or decrease it. So they get much better control of that velocity, uh, obviously without compromising service reliability. And Surya did, did hit on an important point. He, he talked about the notion of uh, blameless, which I like, right? It's, it's the idea that um, it's okay to have some failures. And so if you're able to measure what's an acceptable amount of failure, what we call error budgets, right, in the SRE world, um, then that's, it's a good way to think about it rather than saying we're going to be 100%. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But th these are really the three pillars that we've been seeing as we've been discussing with customers. The first thing is how do you attract changes? So if you think about your business, think about your world, um, the old way of doing it, which is let's say a CMDB system tracks some elements of changes, but doesn't track all of the changes. You've got your DevOps team, which is tracking some changes, but think of like uh, you have a build that goes out the door, gets deployed into production. You might know that a change occurred, but you don't necessarily know what that change was or what the changes were, uh, you know, the PRs and stuff that went into that deployment. And so there's these worlds that exist where changes are transpiring and occurring that aren't fully tracked. Um, so that's one aspect that we see that there um, are certainly some blind spots and challenges for customers uh, and being able to get a better view of everything that's happening in a given environment. The second thing is measuring the impact. And so what this means is, um, uh, I would say the way companies work today is if, if you think of like um, cause and effect, right? You, something happens like your root cause and then it kind of trickles out and, and has some uh, blast radius or some impact of things around it. And then 
something starts to misbehave or act up. So you're looking at the metrics for it and you see that, hey, this, this metric deviated. So I want to take a look at this over here. So that's kind of your cause and effect world. And what we traditionally do with monitoring today is we look at the effect. We look at the aftermath and then we try to walk backwards to uh, determine uh, what the root cause was. And so what measure the impact essentially means in the change world, really for an SRE and stuff, is if you can track the changes that are happening, then can you measure the impact that those changes are having on a given environment? And so this allows you to watch it from the point of root cause and start to see deviations before it starts to impact the business rather than waiting till everything's been impacted and you're kind of walking backwards. Um, so that's another, uh, I would say the second pillar that we have identified in uh, working with customers is just the ability, can, can you measure the impact of changes once the change happens? Um, and then the third one um, is called inform velocity. So um, really, this is exactly as it sounds. So the idea is that um, change velocity is something that you want to maintain. Um, but there are times when you want to slow it down and there are times when you want to speed it up. The times when you want to slow it down are when things are unstable or your environment is unreliable and you feel like customers are getting agitated or frustrated. So you need to inform the teams that are making changes that they need to slow it down or maybe even stop, ask for approval, different types of things that might need to happen because reliability is in jeopardy. Um, so that allows you to inform those teams. The other one, um, and this is again, what Siri was talking about with regards to air budgets, is you might be running at 100%. Things might, might be wonderful. And you might say, look, we, we actually have some room to take a little bit of risk here because we're not in jeopardy of burning our agreement with a customer. So let's take some risk. So maybe that change where you're updating a database or Kubernetes or something like that, where you're holding off and doing that, let's go ahead and do that because we have some room here without impacting our reliability. So those are our three pillars. And so our goal uh, fundamentally is really trying to get the SRE and DevOps team to cooperate, you know, kind of, we'll say tear down the wall, as you saw on the previous slide. Uh, there is this wall that kind of exists bet between the two. I would say there is somewhat of a, a competitiveness that can exist between the two. We want to kind of bring down that wall and we want to make it where the DevOps teams and the SREs are actually cooperating, uh, trading information between each other um, so that they can help, uh, the DevOps team can help the SREs with reliability and the SREs can help the DevOps team um, with velocity. And with that, um, I guess we can open it up for questions, Ravi. Yeah, that, that was awesome. Yeah, like, thank you so much, Siri and Thor, <clears throat> for, for your background. I, I definitely was bringing down production services before blameless culture. I, you know, I kid you not, like in the Confluence documents we put at Ravi, not very blameless, like an engineer at Ravi. <laughs> it's like clearly they knew who it was, who was bringing stuff down. But yeah, like, so if you if you uh, want to contact us or the, well, we'll go through the questions now, but like, feel free to give this a scan if you want to learn more, you know, what we're doing at Harness or if you want to learn more, just what we're trying to accomplish at Harness, uh, feel free. Uh, but let's go through some of the questions and answers or well, the questions <laughs> will provide answers, right? So let's take a look at what we got going on. So I can pair, I can, I can paraphrase these. And so, okay. So the first question is, how is saturation and traffic different? And so I can take a stab at that, Surya Thor. No, go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, so my very, my, my very basic answer is that uh, tra traffic is just that, like how many requests are coming in, right? Or how many requests are not coming in. And then saturation is the underlying infrastructure, like how taxed it is. So like if, you know, if your service is very saturated, you know, you might be handling the traffic, but like you're at capacity, like you can't take a, like a net new request uh, because like, hey, you're, you're pegged at CPU or you're pegged at uh, you know, memory or some sort of uh, infrastructure constraint or network IOD. But if you have a, a cleaner explanation <laughs> than that, happy to hear that. Yeah, I think I think that's good. Okay, cool. Yes, yep. I, got, I got one right. <laughs> <laughs> I got one right. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, I do just want to kind of jump in and say that, um, uh, you know, and, and sir, you did mention the SRE uh, handbook, right? Which which he'll, he'll kind of point to the link if we haven't already provided that. But this is a learning process. You know, uh, being an SRE is is kind of a new concept, and so. 
we're, we're leveraging a lot of the wisdom of, of larger organizations like Google, obviously. But um, as we work with different companies, they do find different measurements relevant or not relevant. So when you talk about saturation and traffic, you might only find one of those measurements is relevant for your organization. And so it is a it is a trial and error kind of learning process as you start to think about your SLOs and how you measure things for your business and whether all of the gold standards or some of them are relevant for you. Anyhow, uh, go ahead. Perfect. Very, very, very funny. Um, I'm skipping to the very last one. Actually, our QR code 404 now. We launched a new website or Tuesday. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> live here. Um, so we'll get you a better link. Sorry about that. Yeah. So live uh, errors. <laughs> uh, it was the okay. SRE. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> just redirects died. Silly Apache. So, all right. Uh, so another question that we have here is, can we explain what an RCA or root cause analysis is? So I, I had very bad ones before. I might hand it over to Surya. You know, when, when we do an, an RCA here or root cause analysis, like what are some of the goals of the RCA? Yeah, so uh, the RCA, I think uh, the question is basically, right? It's root cause analysis. And the whole point of RCA is like, okay, you had an incident. So you want to uh, cover the timeline of the incident like when it happened, how long did the, uh, did the incident last? What exactly caused the incident, right? And what are the action items that we took uh, to make sure that the incident uh, won't happen again? Or what are the learnings from? Now, when we say blameless, right? We don't want to take anyone's name. It's, uh, it may be an intern doing something. It may be an experienced guy doing something. It doesn't matter. It's just an incident happened which impacted your customers. And we want to document that. We want to share it with the customers, right? So I'll just post a link here uh, in the Zoom chat for everyone. Like the, I mentioned like we post pretty much all of our incidents in the Medium blog. So you can, uh, when you have some time, please check it out. So we describe one of the incidents uh, that happened um, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular link. So if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to ask now. Perfect. I think that also you posted a link. Uh, to the Google SRE handbook. Yes, so. I did. Uh, so one of the question was uh, about the link to the Google SRE. So I posted that. Also. Awesome. And so, so next question there uh, would be, um, can organizations adopt DevSecOps and SRE practices? So I, I'll hold my tongue on this one. If one of you two, how, so it'd be like, how do you and Andrew? Can... Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was it, was it the do organizations usually adopt both DevOps and SRE? Is That's it that one? Or, de or it's the... Yeah, DevSecOps. DevSecOps. Yeah, DevSecOps, yeah, yeah. which is just a, a branch, let's say, of DevOps, right? It's a, a focus. Um, so I'll answer the first one, and then maybe, um, Suri, you can answer the second question as part of that, since the question's kind of, you know, how do we handle it here at Harness? So I'll, I'll tell you what I'm seeing with customers. Uh, I'm seeing kind of it's all over the place. I'll, I'll just kind of answer honestly there, which is essentially that really dependent upon which team got started first, that becomes the more dominant team within the organization. But I definitely am seeing that if organizations are larger where there are two separate organizations, um, they tend to be siloed, meaning that, um, and this is why we've been talk to, talking about that connective tissue is how do we bring those organizations to work collectively together rather than um, separately and in silos. But if the organization is smaller, uh, meaning it's a, it's a single group, um, they tend to take on the practices more related to uh, how they started. So if they started as a DevSecOps and are making their way into SRE, they're going to follow the practices more towards DevSecOps and vice versa is also true. Um, but I'll let you, Suri, answer kind of the... Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, like I think Thor answered uh, the half part of it, right? So at Harness, uh, so... I, I used to manage the security team before I just started focusing solely on the SRE side, right? Uh, the security is important, right? I mean, without that, uh, there, there will be incidents in production because of that. We had one incident uh, where uh, one of the web application firewall that we configured uh, led, to an in, led to an incident in production, right? But this DevSecOps is a very broad term. So from Harness point of view, uh, we have this whole GCP infrastructure security. We have the application security that work very closely with SRE, right? For example, uh, with the images that we use, right? And we have on-prem and SaaS, both offerings, right? For some of the on-prem security conscious customers, 
they want to make sure that the images base images that we provide are very secure so the security team uh, for every release they scan the images right whether it's ubuntu or debian or alpine they scan the images we publish the results of it and we post it to our customers now some of the other companies are much more agile in the sense like this whole security scanning the code scanning are part of the build pipelines themselves so we are also taking that approach where we are going to use our own cie the continuous integration product we will have the build pipelines uh, integrate with some of this uh, security scanning tools and uh, we make sure that it passes before the build or the artifact is generated for us so to answer uh, the security and sre needs to work closely together i mean we don't have a choice right because if an incident happens in production you need to have the security guys on the call if it's related to some uh, external traffic trying to hack your system or it's something very internal where your traffic is blocked by the proxy and you don't know what exactly is going on so yeah those two needs to work closely together to answer the question <clears throat> awesome awesome answer so uh, kind of tackling a little bit more. I know we're coming up on time here. We don't have quite time for one or two more, but uh, tackling uh, this question about the, the good book, the Google SRE book, uh, talking about how the split between DevOps and uh, SRE and versus <clears throat> is SRE an extension of DevOps or vice versa? Um, I, I can give, let me, I'll give my, my quick or not quick <laughs> explanation here. Uh, is that, you know, it's actually two different problem sets. Like I wholeheartedly agree with Thor that the, the, what one team on one hand is focused on the development pipeline, the DevOps teams, they're focused on velocity. And absolutely, like anytime you introduce change to a system, reliability is a problem. If nothing has ever changed, it's fairly reliable, right? Like, hey, you know, you, it's, I, I had made zero changes in 20 years, minus if there's a mechanical failure or hardware failure, you know, that it would be, the, the same, you, exp you experience the same results over and over, but that's not innovation, right? And that's not, you know, that's not dazzling your customer. You know, you'll be stuck in the past. Um, <clears throat> typically what, what I've seen is, is just, as, again, going back to expertise dissemination. So, uh, you know, the DevOps team will focus on, hey, let's focus on how do we get your ideas into production? Uh, so like if you typically, the, the persona of DevOps engineer in my experience is a system engineer focused on the development pipeline. Uh, vice versa uh, with the SRE, my experience with SRE scenes is that, they're software engineers focused on operational problems. So for example, hey, the, the romantic idea of an SRE is that, oh no, our application can't scale. You know what, Surya, no matter if I add another Mongo node, we're not getting any faster and we're past that point. That, that, you know, that's, that, that's a very, you know, who, who owns that problem? Is it the software engineer? Is it an SRE? Like it is a very, uh, I would say software engineering focused problem a different flavor of it. So long-winded answer, long-winded, no answer, answer. <laughs> I just <laughs> came there, but I'm not sure if you two have any other. I do. Uh, yeah. So, and, and just kind of talking directly to you, Oliver, it's, um, it's, it's a battle actually we're having internally right now as we build out a product uh, that is uh, adding the capabilities to measure and track uh, service levels, right? SLOs, SLIs, that sort of stuff. And there, there's kind of this debate between, you know, what the what the Bible says, right, which is you, you kind of take it as like your your doctrine. This is the Google handbook this is what it says to do. And then you have what customers are actually doing. Um, and those two things aren't always aligned. And that's the challenge for us, especially as we start to build out a product is do we meet customers where they're at today um, or do we try to force them into a way of thinking that the book says they should be thinking? Um, and so when we kind of put together these slides, it was more in the context of how we see customers operating today, even though technically, let's say in, in, the, in the perfect world, uh, what you say is correct in the Google handbook, which is maybe they're all just one thing in the end, but we don't see that currently. That would be awesome though. It'd make our life a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, there's been like other renditions to the good book, right? Like I know they came out with like a 2020 edition or <laughs> like a, of the book where they had it yeah. for free for like a month and it took it out for free. So. Yeah, we've we've been, trust me, I've been dissecting it quite a bit. And there's just, there's areas in there that are more aspirational that you're just like, man, you know, customers just aren't working this way right now. So we have to kind of meet them where they're at. Cool. I know. I think we're just coming up on time. I know there's a couple of open questions, okay. but if you ever want to get in contact with us, you, know, you can hit us up. We have a Slack on Harness.io. 
you can just hit any one of our community Slack. You can get to us. Uh, I'm not sure if any closing closing words here uh, from the Linux Foundation. Yeah. So thank you so much, Ravi, Surya, and Thor for your time today. That was a great presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just a quick reminder that this recording will be added to the Linux Foundation's YouTube page shortly. So you can um, check back there and review or send it along to others if you'd like. Um, and we hope that you will join us for future webinars. So thank you so much again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Cheers. Bye.